and welcome to Thoro Newspaper Analysis, which is presented to you by Lossico. So today we have uh, two articles, and both are from the Indian Express. The first article is about uh, clearing the COVID test, which basically talks about the uh, very nice, as in a way, you know, a very efficient performance of the Election Commission of India during the conduction of the uh, state assembly elections in Bihar. So we will discuss as to what are the what were the proactive steps that were taken by the ECI to um, uh, have concluded uh, the elections in such a successful manner, and secondly. The Plain Truth, which is again from the Indian Express. So this talks about the uh, very um, typical language which is often used in various judgments and how is it not a good sign and how we should be uh, leaning towards using a simple uh, language or a, or a simpler language so that it is more you know, legible and understandable by the common people. And finally, we have the news and flash column wherein we'll be discussing the small and crisp news points that are more important for our prelims exam. So if you're also preparing for a judicial services exam, you can definitely have a look at the Los Hico course that we have for you. The link is there in the description box and you can also download free study material from there. So this is the multiple choice question for the day. What is the full form of ASEAN? First, Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Second, Administration of Southeast Asian Nations. Third, Organization of Southeast Asian Nations or fourth, administration of the Southeast Asian nations, of, of the Southeast Asian, uh, Asia, uh, Asian regions, and this is the Southern East. So you have to write down the correct answer. You can write it down in the comment section below. So this is the descriptive question for the day. Discuss the measures taken by the Election Commission of India in addressing the challenges posed by the pandemic in the election process. So this is entirely about what, what steps have been taken by the ECI for the successful conclusion of the election. Specifically, we talk about the Bihar elections that have recently concluded. So uh, let's uh, start with the first uh, article for the day, which talks about the election during COVID-19. So while conducting the Bihar assembly elections, the Election Commission of India was inspired by the successful experiences of many countries, especially. So now, uh, as we know that very recently, the state assembly elections in Bihar have concluded. And uh, in that regard, uh, it needs to be seen that Bihar was one of those states of our country which were most uh, worstly you know, affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, be it in the sector of economy, be it in the center, sector of health, employment, or any uh, ways, if you would see education as well. But still, the uh, entire conduction of Bihar Assembly elections has been an example for the entire country because it has been done with so much of efficiency and it has been very successful, even as compared to the normal time elections that, that were uh, generally conducted or that are generally conducted in the various states. So in this regard, uh, in such a time, we need to see as to what steps were taken by the Election Commission of India in order to make these elections very safe and also to ensure that the voter turnout also is not suffered due to the COVID-19 pandemic. So in that regard, the Election Commission of India had taken the examples and also had shared or want, uh, had taken the knowledge from 34 countries that had already conducted the elections and most of them had actually conducted elections to their national bodies, uh, to the national elections, even during the pandemic. So it was, it is such a nice, uh, in a way, you know, we can say, being very uh, uh, far-sighted that the election commission of india firstly it had a talk with all of these nations to understand as to what are the basic challenges what were the proactive steps that these country ha countries had taken and learning from their experiences the entire uh, setup was made in the uh, state of bihar by the election commission of india as well now here let's see that what were the challenges that were faced by the um, uh, election commission of india firstly there was a possibility of low turnout because obviously as we just discussed that bihar was one of the uh, worst stricken state uh, due to covid 19 and in such a scenario it was uh, very much um in a way predictable to know that the people would not be really willing to come out of their homes and move out in a place that is crowded and touch various things that they, they which a lot of people are already touching or are in contact into and that is why there was an apprehension that maybe the people or like the, the potential voters would not really turn out and would not really come in huge numbers to cast their vote. So the Election Commission of India extended the postal ballot option to senior citizens. Now, 
this actually did not happen and it was it has a bihar election has seen a very good voter turnout as in the normal scenario as well so what the eci did to uh, settle down this problem was that it extended the postal ballot option to senior citizens above the 80 above the age of 80 years because as we know that the covid 19 is more dangerous for the senior citizens as well as people who have another another comorbidities like diabetes cancer or any kind of heart ailments and that is why for at least for the senior citizens above the age of 80 the postal ballot system was made where in the ballot could actually move to the area where these people resided and they did not really literally have to move towards the postal ballot to cast their vote for the covid patients as well so this is such an important thing and such a praiseworthy step that was taken by eci that as we know that a lot of uh, people were suffering uh, due to the covid 19 even during the conduction of elections but still they were not left out and they very much had the right to uh, enjoy their adult universal adult franchise and that is why even the postal ballot system was made available to the covid patients from hospital to hospital and homes to homes and disabled and also the voters in the essential services because like they, there were various voters like uh, in the essential services like the policemen the doctors then uh, other kinds of you know banks the people who are working in banks and so so on and so forth so many a times they were not available in their normal uh, regions where they live or they reside and still to make sure that they are also not devoid of their uh, right to vote so they also were given the right of uh, the postal ballot and as well as the disabled people which actually made sure that the voter turnout does not fall low then next low internet penetration because only 37% of bihar population of bihar area is covered through internet and phones are used only by 27% of the population now basically because what happened was that the election commission of india said that the uh, rallies or the political agenda or the political interactions would not be taken up in through any offline means like earlier as we know the people or the candidates they walk home to home they talk to the people and then they like they ask for the vote in the uh, one on one basis but in this pandemic it was made completely restricted that these uh, like rallies would not be allowed and the entire propaganda and the uh, entire movement of the rallies would be done on an online basis wherein you can use the means of internet phones um, facebook and various other medium media that are available for this regard so this was another challenge which was faced and also many opposition parties claimed that since the bjp uh, has a greater access to these resources so there might be a chance that they would be given better uh, like um, resources they would have better resources and money as well to do this which in a way it, it, maybe it was possible but still the other parties had uh, have also fared well in this regard and then the other challenge was a fake news and hate propaganda so basically to curb or to put down this uh, fake news or any kind of hate, hate propaganda that is very very easy to float uh, on an online uh, on 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 online platforms so to curb that the eci drafted a voluntary code of ethics just like we have a model code of conduct for the candidates uh, the eci drafted a voluntary code of ethics in collaboration with the social media platforms and it was made sure that if at all any kind of hate propaganda or hate speech or fake news is prevailing or floating on any social media platform then that social media platform shall be responsible for putting it down as soon as possible and also the election commission of india held not even just one or two but four press conferences during the counting to make sure that any kinds of doubts that are coming from the press or the people or the voters or anybody or any stakeholder for that matter they are cleared not by any other person but any other institution or body but just the election commission of india so these were other uh, guidelines that were given by the like the covid guidelines which are given by the eci first electors per polling booth reduced from 1500 to 1000 to obviously avoid the overcrowding and to do this additional 40000 extra polling stations and extra evms which are the electronic voting machines were put up then counting tables were reduced to 7 per hall from 14 to per hall because definitely we are uh, we were we had to follow the norm of um, social and physical distancing and door to door canvassing restricted to 5 persons convoys broken to five vehicles which was instead earlier for 10 vehicles number of participants in public meetings were restricted and online facilities were provided for nomination filing of the affidavits and even for the security deposits so that the offices of the election commission or other uh, related offices are not overcrowded by the candidates or their supporters 
So basically, this has shown a very efficient movement that was taken up by the Election Commission of India. And this really uh, gives a victorious stand to the ECI because it was definitely not easy to hold elections in state like Bihar, which was already suffering from, which was like already suffering hugely from this pandemic. But still, it has been a successful example. And we really should be proud of the efforts of the Election Commission of India. With this, let's discuss the second article for the day, which talks about the legal language in India. So a PIL has recently been filed in the Supreme Court, which is uh, named as Subhash Vijayaran versus Union of India. And this PIL has requested the Supreme Court to direct, firstly, the legislature and executive to use plain English in drafting the laws. As we know that many a times the language which is used in the barracks or other, uh, you know, uh, legal um, uh, literature uh, it's so difficult to understand and a common person is just not able to understand these jargons or the kind of language language that is used in these drafting of laws and secondly to direct the bar council to introduce plain english in law please uh, consider this is plain english in law curricula and supreme court to allow concise and precise pleadings so these are the uh, all contentions that have been put up by this pil in the case of subhash vijayan versus union of india and we need to what we uh, specifically need to understand is as to what is the problem with the legal language now, since all of you also, most of you who are listening to this news analysis are preparing for judicial services and you definitely dream to uh, hold the office of a judicial officer very soon. And uh, in this regard, it is very important for us also to understand as to what is the plight of a person who actually is reading our judgment. So one day, like if you are also writing a judgment in a very important case and that judgment is something that is sought by all of the people and they want to read it. But if the language of the ju that judgment is not easy to understand, what is the point of writing that judgment, right? So if it is just not able to communicate the very message that you wanted to give, there is definitely no point giving that judgment. So here, let's understand that what are the specific problems of a legal language, of the legal language that is used in judgments and other uh, draft laws, and what should be done to uh, tackle with it. So firstly, Lawyers use words which are wordy, unclear, pompous, and dull. So many a times the lawyers also in the tandem to basically, you know, maybe impress the courtroom, the judges, or maybe the clients whatsoever, they use words which are so difficult to interpret in the first stance that it really gives no clear idea as to what that lawyer is trying to say. And it's just basically, you know, see, whenever you are trying to communicate, the basic tenant or the basic principle of a good communication is that the other person should perceive exactly what you are trying to convey. Now, you are sounding really flowery and very nice to listen, but what is the point if the other person just does not get the idea of what you were actually trying to tell? So that definitely is not an example of a good communication. And that is why the lawyers should also use words that are very clear, very precise, and they give the exact meaning of as to what they are trying to say instead of using very flowery or very, you know, uh, decorative language. Secondly, comprises of technical vocabulary because obviously we have a lot of words where, wherein we, we use uh, various technical and legal uh, words like Latin terms like, you know, uh, ab initio, recepsa liquidor, or various kinds of maxims as well, which are easily not, um, which, which cannot be easily understood by a common reader. And this should also be avoided if at all it does not hamper the very meaning of the judgment to be given. Then it is different from the normal language used. Yes, it is. Heavily relies on the archaic expressions like res judicata, bona fide, actus reus, mens rea, uh, ad hoc, and uh, various other expressions. And then also, it is often structured in passive vo voice. So uh, here are some things that we should be avoiding because uh, many you know, uh, jurists or many other uh, people have been talking about, many other uh, philosophers have talked about how the language of law can be made plain and more receptible and more e easier to understand. And they say that we should not, uh, we should avoid firstly use of any kind of heavy words or jargons that are not easily understood and not even commonly used amongst the common language in the common language. Then next, we should try to use active voice. Like passive voice is obviously, as we know, that it makes uh, something very difficult, like a, a bit complex to understand. I'll give you just a very simple example of this, like uh, so that you can understand as to what do we mean by active and passive voice in here, if at all you have uh, like uh, forgotten the idea. So for example, if I say, I eat an apple, this is the very simple straight, uh, this is a sentence, which, which is an active voice, which simply gives you an idea that I eat an apple. That's it. 
but when i try to speak it into an into passive voice the thing that i would be speaking is an apple is eaten by me so it is just the same thing but the sentence looks more complex and difficult to understand as to who or what is the more important thing the apple or was it me who was eating that apple so in a way when it is done into like in the legal language it becomes even more complex so that is how it should be avoided and we should try to make use of plain simple and active voice while we are talking in a judgment so this was the basic thing about this article let's see what do we have for news in flash today prime minister modi to co-chair india asean summit so it is the 17th indian as india asean summit which is a 10 nation asean as we know that these are the 10 nations of the asean which is the association of the southeast asian nations is expected to focus on measures to recover from the economic turmoil which has been triggered by covid-19 and ways to further broad base strategic ties so it will be co-chaired by vietnam prime minister Guyen Zuan Phu, and uh, this will be conducted very soon. So, as you know, these this is also very important. You should know what are the all ten nations of the ASEAN, and obviously they are all southeastern nations because the name itself is suggesting it is a geopolitical, uh, in a way, association. Secondly, OTT content reg under regulation. So, OTT content is simply the over-the-top platforms like we have Netflix, we have Amazon Prime, Hotstar, and um, Voot, and various other you know these apps or applications of these platforms where this content is very easily and readily available over the top. Like just we have over-the-top medicines which can easily be availed through any chemist or any medical shop. Similarly, these this content can also be very easily available. You just have to pay for these applications, and you already are good to go. So the government has uh, brought a uh, video streaming over the top platforms, among others, under the Ministry of Information and Broadcasting. So with this, the OTT platforms might have to apply for certification and approval of their content. Now this thing needs to be seen that a lot of turmoil these days has been happening uh, when people are talking about the decency or the question of decency and the indecent material or the videos that are available on various OTT platforms. so because uh, in this uh, kind of uh, streaming you don't really need to get any kind of certificate from the censor board or something like that unlike the situation where in films and everything you have to get the certificate of censor board so that is why many times it has been claimed that since these platforms are available to the children also of all age groups so it is very detrimental for their mental growth and also they can uh, they tend to learn things that are not appropriate for their age at that time to learn and in that to in a wrong manner so that is why to avoid such situations the ott platforms are also now brought under the uh, ambit of the ministry of information and broadcasting and now uh, they will they might let's see that what uh, outcome uh, finally comes out they might be required to also have a certificate and approval of their content and so that it is appropriate for the viewership at all so this was all for today we hope it was a good session for you thank you so much mm -hmm.